Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, it's nice to virtually be uh, in Trieste right now. Um, and uh, so um, I'm uh, gonna talk about um, the quantum utility highway. We're running out of uh, adjectives here, but uh, um, uh, this is joint work with my colleague at D-Wave Powell Ferry. And um, so, um, so what we mean by uh, quantum utility is the, uh, the true cost of using quantum and accessing quantum computation as experienced by a user in uh, typical use cases. And uh, as everyone knows, uh, quantum annealing works by the declarative paradigm. So instead of implementing an algorithm to solve your problem, uh, what you do instead, the algorithm's already implemented and you transform your problem, translate your problem into a formulation that is compatible with the already implemented solver. And that translation creates overhead. There's, you know, computation time required to do that. And so that's the type of overhead we're looking at. There's also some overhead costs due to layering. And we want to know if uh, uh, it would be cost effective to swap out the quantum solver and replace it uh, with a classical alternative at uh, different levels, at different layers of these, of these overhead costs. So, uh, in particular, in the long one, we, we want to show that even if you out, if even when you consider these overheads, uh, the quantum solution is uh, performing classical alternatives. Um, and on the way to getting to that place, we can work outwards uh, with increasing um, increasing overheads and uh, establish early milestones. So today, I'm not going to talk about uh, milestone zero annealed time. Uh, pure annealed time with no overheads that will kind of follow from the from the next two milestones. Uh, but I'm going to talk about considering the overhead of chip access, which is uh, programming and readout time, basically, and the, the delays that are built into that. And the overhead, the additional overhead that is the indirect cost of minor embedding. You, the logical solvers can take an, a logical problem, an original problem of size n, uh, it has to be minor embedded on onto the um, onto the chip, and that creates a larger problem of of size Q. And the question is, you know, how much do you? What's the penalty for having to increase your problem size? And there are more milestones ahead, but I'm going to talk to these talk uh, talk about these two today. So uh, for milestone uh, one, uh, talking about chip access. The, this is a, a, just a cartoon that sort of shows generally how things go, but you see on the bottom here that quantum annealing, if you want to uh, sample 200 solutions in, in 100 microseconds, I'm, I'm sorry, 100 milliseconds, a large part of your time is spent, with this line indicates the programming time, it really dominates the computation, the chip programming time. The actual anneal time is about half the width of one of these dots here and uh, as, as I've drawn it. And so the anneal time is very fast compared to the total to cost of computation. And uh, you can get quite a few samples in, uh, in 100 milliseconds. You can get about 200 in this scenario that I drew, but, um, but a lot of that time is just simply chip, uh, is chip programming time. Whereas uh, the, the teal dots at the top are something like a greedy algorithm that, that is just falling down to the, the minimum, uh, you know, a local minimum as quickly as possible and starting over. And, uh, you know, it produces solutions from some probability. It's fast and it produces solutions from some probability distribution, but they might not be, uh, you know, they might be, uh, they're not necessarily uh, optimal, certainly. Uh, solvers or algorithms heuristics like simulated annealing have a parameter, the, the number of sweeps, and you can actually adjust that. If you're only interested in getting one solution, uh, it's, it's usually most cost effective to just set, uh, set the, the thing to anneal very slowly to, to have a huge number of sweeps. And you know you could imagine that if you extend this even longer and have more time, that it might converge to even better solutions. But on the other hand, if you want to use simulated annealing to get 10 solutions within the same time period, um, the anneals have to be shorter and you're going to get less, uh, you know, worse quality solutions, basically. So there's a trade-off there in terms of numbers of sweeps and numbers of time. So 
this is the scenario in which we're going to look at this performance. Um, the QPU time is going to include uh, what we call access time programming plus readout. In this test, all of the solvers will be reading uh, uh, physical inputs that are uh, directly on the Pegasus graph. And um, we're looking for the best median solution in some sample size S in some time limit T uh, for various um, values of S and T. And uh, for milestone two, uh, in addition to uh, the access time and the scenario I just considered, we're also going to consider the indirect cost of minor embedding. And that basically means that uh, some uh, classical solvers can, you know, they're able to read an arbitrary, as an input of arbitrary structure, and that has n variables. But before the quantum processor can solve it, it has to be. Uh, mapped onto the Pegasus graph in this case, and um, that uh, adds variables. And so it's reading a much larger input, and we're kind of looking at the, the cost involved there. Now, we all know that with this lower bound on, on uh, programming time, that when n is very small, um, classical solvers, you know, they can have, they can run fast or slow on different inputs. But when n is very small, they have nanosecond scale instruction sets, and and the classical solver can just just uh, find optimal solutions while the while the uh, the quantum system is still programming. And so we're we're looking for uh, more or less n being large enough that there's a chance that the the quantum processor can outperform uh, classical. So. Uh, we used one experiment to uh, to study both of these questions. Uh, they in, it, it's, here's how it works. We have one quantum processor. It's an advantage processor that's currently online. Uh, looked at four classical solvers that read arbitrary uh, uh, graphs, arbitrary inputs, and two physical solvers that read uh, chimera structured inputs only, and they're implemented on GPUs. Um, that, you know, that being said, all solvers can read all of the inputs, pre-embedded or post-embedded, or if they're native, then it's the same thing. Um, uh, we assume a typical use case for, uh, for heuristic optimization, uh, all the parameters are fixed or auto-tuned. The, the users are not interested in spending more time tuning than they are actually just solving the problem. And we generated uh, 25 inputs each uh, from 13 different input uh, classes, categories. Five of them are native and eight of them are logical uh, input classes. And in all cases, we are looking at the largest N that fits on the current chip uh, according to a specific embedding policy. So we set up uh, these tests for a variety of runtimes from 20 milliseconds up to one second and for four sample sizes, uh, one through 1,000 samples. Um, that gives you 24 uh, combinations of TNS, and uh, five of them, which are very short run times and very high sample sizes, uh, we omit. They can't be uh, uh, served by the quantum processor because of the overhead cost, basically. So. Um, so that's, that's the test we're running. Uh, and then what we're looking at um, is uh, the best solution found, or rather the best sample median found uh, in time t, which in the case when, S, when the sample is of size one, that's simply the best solution found. So uh, for the inputs and the solvers, here's a list of the inputs we used. Five of them are native. Uh, mapped directly onto the, on the, onto the uh, Pegasus graph, and eight of them are, um, are logical problems that, that are motivated by um, real-world uh, applications. We have uh, three physical solvers. One of them is quantum, and two of them are simulated annealing implemented on uh, GPUs. One of them has its parameters set more for optimization, and one has parameters set more for sampling. Uh, so we could cover both scenarios. And then we have four classical logical solvers um, that um, in all cases are either have default parameter settings or uh, some auto-tuning is used to determine the number of sweeps in the, in the ones that can be controlled that way. So, uh, excuse me, just looking at the output, 
this is like a result of a little mini test using three inputs. Across the columns, you see uh, different in increasing sample sizes, and all of the little graphs here are for a half second run times. And uh, what we did for each input class uh, is uh, compute the median relative energy of the sample. Um, and um, the x axis here is the 25 inputs uh, in rank order. So this is an empirical cumulative distribution plot. And I've put a blue dot in every one of these panels where the blue curve, the um, quantum annealing, the QPU curve is strictly below all of the solution qualities for all of the other solvers. And so uh, in particular for S equals one and T equals 0.5 out of these three tests, the QPU wins in two of the tests. This is called a horse race uh, analysis. You have winners and ties and you're looking for you're looking for just counting out how many wins you get. So in this case, when S is a thousand and T is uh, half a second, the quantum annealer wins all three times. And the other thing we're looking at is uh, classical fails. And that happens when, for example, when S is a thousand and T equals uh, half a second, um, you, you notice a lot of the lines are missing in these graphs, and that's because the classical solvers simply can't return a thousand seconds, in, a thousand samples in a half a second. It, it, they're reaching their own lower bounds and just can't, uh, can't fulfill the task. And so we're looking at those two questions uh, uh, going forward here. So the results for milestone one, if you consider only the access time, uh, uh, which is a kneel time programming and readout. Uh, that's about 100 times slower than the pure kneel time. Then uh, how many of the 13 inputs, uh, input classes does the QPU win or tie on? And uh, these are cases where the classical, uh, the uh, logical programmers problems are only reading the, the native, the logical solvers are only re reading the native inputs and the, uh, the native solvers are reading all of the physical inputs. So they're all reading the same physical inputs. Uh, and you can see that the quantum annealer is always winning nearly. And, you know, there's one case with small inputs um, that uh, the quantum annealer didn't win in. But out of these 13 cases, it's beating all of the classical solvers in nearly all cases. So we're going to call that a milestone past. Uh, basically. And then for milestone two, uh, if you consider only the logical inputs and the logical solvers working on the smaller problem, whereas the quantum processor is working on the larger problem, we can see the quantum processor isn't, isn't uh, winning all the time. Uh, but it still can uh, win in some cases. And in particular, it's doing best in this upper range where the run times are small and the sample sizes are large. And um, uh, that's, those are the places where it's finding some success. And if we look at classical fails, uh, in each of these boxes, there's, uh, there's uh, six solvers. And uh, you ask how many of them didn't, didn't qualify, couldn't solve the problem uh, in each of the 15 cases. And the answer in, one, in this case, I'm you know, up in the upper right hand corner is in 2.8. Uh, solvers on average couldn't couldn't fulfill the task, and you can see the cases where the classical solvers are having trouble is the same cases where the quantum solver is doing well. So if we look at uh, an explanation for this uh, behavior and what is it about these inputs that make the problems easy for the quantum processor and hard for the the classical solvers, basically the the single most important indicator is what is the the solution what is n. What is the number of, um, how many variables does the problem have? And you can see here in our two extreme cases where we have cliques, a clique of, of size 175 variables versus a native problem which has 5,000 variables. You can see the difference uh, pretty uh, clearly here is that um, blue is the QPU, green is simulated kneeling, and red is uh, uh, steepest greedy descent. And then we have random solutions up here for just a, you know, a, 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 bit, a line in the sand. And when the problems are small, just 175 variables, the greedy solver and simulated annealing are finding what, what are, we can assume are optimal solutions because of the consensus 
um, very quickly in the gray band here, the gray region is, is the operational region for the quantum annealer after some programming time. And uh, there's a, a time limit of one second imposed on, on users, uh, online users. And so this is from, the, from taking one sample uh, up to taking a, a half second, basically, run times. And in that half second, because the problems are so small, classical really has no problem just converging very quickly uh, before a quantum annealer even gets started because of its overheads. Whereas, uh, you know, the problem gets 30 times bigger and, and the uh, classical solvers, of course, their run times uh, increase with n, uh, you know, exponentially. And uh, we're, but we're keeping the run times the same and the sample size is the same. And they just can't, uh, they can't do the job in that, in that comparatively short run time. Whereas the quantum annealer is, is, is doing fine on these really large problems. It does better on the large sparse problems than it does on the small dense problems because of chains and chain lengths. But, but the real point is it's doing better on large inputs than it does on uh, small inputs. And, you know, I'll say uh, the first time I ever uh, did any uh, benchmarking work on a quantum annealer was the D-Wave 2 a decade ago. And these were the same run times we were looking at then. So they, you know, it only had 500 qubits uh, and it w got mixed results against classical, but the, the run time of the quantum processor the effective runtime for users hasn't changed in, in five generations in 10 years. And um, whereas classical solvers have just, uh, you know, been getting, uh, struggling more and more to keep up with that kind of runtime. And so uh, that bodes well, we think, for the future systems. Milestone one is really about the past and where we are right now. Uh, we can see that the QPU it does just fine against classical uh, if you're considering these overheads of uh, programming and readout. In terms of that uh, balance between large n, uh, 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 between um, n, the problem size, and uh, the logical problem size, and Q, the embedded problem size, it's not so much about the difference, the ratio between n and Q, as it, the fact that n, uh, when, it's, when it's a very small, dense problem, is still so close to the programming time that classical is, is you know, eating these problems for lunch. And so we expect that as the processor gets bigger, uh, and the quantum overhead costs pretty much stay the same and the quantum solution quality, it has improved every generation in terms of the fidelity and the noise suppression. Uh, we expect that basically the, uh, the, the inevitable exponential uh, overhead cost of classical with increasing N and fixed T is, is going to lead to more classical fails and more quantum wins. And uh, that's it. Thank Are you. there any questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Thank you, speaker. So, questions? Let's uh, let's check the chat if there are. Uh, I've got a question, actually. Um, so, for on slide twelve, I didn't see anything really converging to the zero relative uh, error on that bottom plot. So how did you compute your upper bound? Was it with some sort of branch and bound method? Did you just run these for a very no, long the, time? It's hard to, um, yeah, we, uh, this is only, uh, you can't uh, in, uh, assume much about what is optimal here. We only looked at relative error compared to the best one in the pool. And so this was, is just, you know, another test with different parameters uh, produced a, a zero point here. So uh, we're not, we're really channeling uh, the typical user experience uh, where classical heuristics are usually uh, evaluated is assumes that there's some sort of a time limit imposed upon the user and they need a solution at some fixed time. They don't necessarily expect to find optimal solutions. And in this case, uh, you know, we, we can kind of uh, assume that if you're seeing a lot of solutions all landing in the same place, it's probably optimal. But uh, we can't assume anything about the native uh, inputs here. Um, maybe, you know, maybe the quantum uh, solutions, no, there must have been some some other solutions that were uh, found outside of this uh, uh, plot that would give us the zero point. 
<clears throat> is that is that answer your question? Yeah, I believe so. I think looking close, I can actually see like a blue cross uh, down on that line, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Right. Good eye. Thank you. Well, and and in general, you know, this was part of a pool of solutions that were returned by all of those experiments. And so it could have come up in, a, in another scenario on this input. Okay. Other questions? Is that it? Thank you for the nice talk. Um, so I guess it's kind of just a general question as to what do you see as some of the, you know, uh, barriers or uh, to kind of wider application use uh, for these type of uh, algorithms? Is it just kind of mm -hmm. still education or is it just kind of getting bigger test beds or better integration with the... Um, well, I think, I, you know, I think uh, as, uh, as the processor grows, part of it, you know, there are a lot of uh, application problems that are really, we, we did try to, you know, really uh, go for application inspired uh, logical structures. Uh, but there are problems with constraints that are just basically not large enough yet. We can't embed large enough problems given the, um, excuse me, the extra number of qubits needed to, in, to represent constraints. So in terms of broadening the scope, uh, yeah, I think larger inputs. And, you know, that's kind of why we have a, a, a vigorous um, hybrid uh, computation, uh, you know, uh, support right now. We have, uh, you know, while waiting for the process to get bigger, we have uh, uh, some hybrid uh, solvers that, uh, Take, decompose large problems and put, you know, put them, send queries to the quantum processor to sort of guide the, the search for large problems. But uh, to my mind, it's mostly about getting bigger so that, uh, you know, more, greater variety of problems can be represented. Okay, other questions? Still. Very nice talk, thanks. I just had a question of whether uh, you tried uh, on this slide parallel tempering as well. Yeah, that's what the PT is, parallel tempering. We had um, two versions of it that, uh, you know, parallel tempering has a lot of parameters um, and we, we tried them two different ways, uh, basically. Okay, so I was asking on the last slide whether you had also results for parallel tempering. Because I only saw. Oh, uh, no. Um, I would say uh, generally, uh, yeah, we, we, it started getting too cluttered. So we, I guess we just stopped. But uh, parallel tempering, uh, you know, has more loops and more parameters. And it generally starts later than, um, than simulated annealing. It's, it has its own uh, quite considerable overheads. And uh, both of those parallel tempering codes were the ones most likely to fail when the when the times got got uh, small and the sample sizes got large. So it's quite a complex algorithm. It's it's just not fast enough for these for these uh, you know very fast uh, scenarios. Other questions? No. Okay, so let's thank Catherine again. <clears throat> and we move we move to another online talk.